Now we're going to talk about functions, a set of functions, and are they literally independent or literally dependent? To remind you what that means, what we talked about in class, a set of functions f1 through fn are literally independent if c1 times f1 plus c2 times f2 plus c3 times f3 plus dot 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 plus c sub n times f sub n equals zero if and only if all the c's are zero. In other words, you can't take one of them, take for instance f2, and write it as a linear combination of the others. In other words, a constant plus a function plus a constant plus a, uh, times a function, excuse me, plus a constant times a function plus a constant times a function. You can't take one and write it in that way. That's what it means to be linearly independent. Otherwise, you'd be able to write, say, c sub 2 as a constant times f1 plus a constant times f3. That would be linearly dependent. So I picked out three examples. Let's see if these sets of functions are linearly dependent or linearly independent. The first one I have is 5 cosine squared x sine squared x. So the question is, are these linearly independent or linearly dependent? Now, I could use the wrong skin. But also, I do remember that cosine squared x plus sine squared x equals 1. That's an x. That equals 1. So let me see if I can use that. So let's let minus 1 fifth times 5, that's times the first constant, plus 1 times cosine squared x, plus 1 times sine squared x. Let's see, let's see what we get. Well, of course, minus 1 fifth times 5 is minus 1. As we said, cosine squared x plus sine squared x is 1 negative 1 plus 1 is 0. So in this case, c1 equals 1 fifth, c2 equals 1, c3 equals 1. So I can write one of these as a linear combination of the others. Well, you say, how can I do that? Well, let me show you. 5 equals 5 times cosine squared x plus 5 times sine squared x. So f1 equals 5 times f2 plus 5 times f3. So you see f1 is a linear combination of the other two. So this set is linearly dependent. So the first set is linearly dependent. Now let's look at the second set. 1 plus x, x, x squared. Now I'll have students do this on their homework. They'll write f1 is linearly dependent upon f2. They claim it actually isn't, but they claim that. And so they'll say, hey, these are linearly dependent. But it's not actually because it's got to be a constant times the function, not a constant plus a function. So let's, let's take the right skin. So that would be the determinant, 1 plus x, x, x squared. And then since I have 3, I'm going to take two derivatives, because I must have a 3 by 3. Because remember, determinants must be of a square matrix. So the derivative is 1, the derivative is 1, the derivative is 2x. The derivative is 0, the derivative is 0, the derivative is 2. Now, I'm going to uh, make this much easier. I'm going to pick the bottom row. So this is 0 plus 0 
plus, now third row, third column, three plus three is what? Six. Six is even, therefore it's a plus. Two times, mark out the row, mark out the column, I'm left with the determinant 1 plus x, x, 1, 1. So this equals 2 times, what's that determinant? So cross multiply and subtract, so that would be 1 plus x minus x, so that equals 2. That's the Ronskin for this set of functions. Now. If you can pick an x such that the Ronskin is not zero, then they're literally independent. So the, I notice in this one, I don't even have to pick an x, but remember to pick, pick an x. I'm just going to pick x equal to one, so that's two. That does not equal zero. It's a constant function, so regardless of what x I pick, it's not going to be zero. So for, so for these, these are linearly independent. Linearly independent. Last, I come to this example, e to the x, e to the minus x, and hyperbolic sine or cinch of x. So if we remember the definition of cinch, I think we're going to see what we can do. Now, we can do the Ronskin here. And just like over here, we could have done the Ronskin. And the Ronskin would have gotten a zero. On this one, we could do the Ronskin and, and show that it's zero. But how about this? How about if I took negative 1 half e to the x? Then I'm going to take a plus 1 half e to the minus x plus one cinch of x. Well, let's write the cinch of x by its definition. So this is minus one half e to the x plus one half e to the minus x plus e to the x minus e to the minus x over two. So that would be minus one half e to the x plus one half e to the minus x plus e to the x over 2 minus e to the minus x over 2. Well, if you notice, this one cancels out with this one. This one cancels out with this one, so I get 0. So I've got, here's my c1, here's my f1, plus here's my c2, here's my f2, plus here's my C3, here's my F3, and I can get this to be zero without requiring all of them to be zero, because C1, C2, and C3, none of them are actually zero in this case. So we have, if it's literally dependent, and by the way, these are literally dependent. If they're literally dependent, it's easier to show it just straightforward by doing what I've done in these two examples. If they're linearly independent, the only way to do it is by the Ronskin. And you always need to give at least one x where it's non-zero, the Ronskin. So that's linearly independence.